Good afternoon. I think uh, the last session was so energetic that folks are over there talking about getting on the lingering con conversations there. But let's start on time here. We have a very good lineup of speakers who are uh, on the top of their, you know, in their industry. There's a lot of good work that they have done and we want to share with it. So the basic question they're trying to address in this panel is how to use cloud-based controls for building automation system. What are the benefits there? What's the cost there? Why aren't people using it? Why should we be using it? So there's a whole host of questions that we have. The opportunity is humongous as I understand it, but the industry is not using it right now. So what are their holdbacks? How can we make this uh, come true in the near future and make sure that we take the full benefits of these technologies? You know, I was uh, talking to our team here, I said, I would like to see a 10% of the building controls go to the cloud market in the next 10 years. That will be significant progress. Right now, I think it's not even a fraction of a 0.0001% kind of a thing, so it's going to be a tremendous progress in that area. And the opportunities are great, and they'll talk about what those opportunities are. So we have four outstanding speakers here. Um, Ulf, he is our, uh, uh, no, he leads the R&D activities uh, at SRI International. Um, you have the speaker bios there, but the program director um, focused on infrastructure, security for government and commercial buildings. Very apt topic because some of the issues that I've heard from people who are not using this technology fully is because of the security concerns. We take off from there, and Ulf, want to start? All right, sure, thank you. Yes, my name is Ulf Lindquist, and I'm with SRI International, which is an independent nonprofit research center just around the corner from here, and of course was founded in 1946 as Stanford Research in Institute, but it's independent since the 70s. Um, so at SRI, we take pride in, in working on important problems, not just interesting problems. And cybersecurity for anything that has to do with critical infrastructure is, of course, an important problem. So I'm the token cybersecurity person on this uh, panel, and this is why you may think that you have walked into the wrong panel, because <laughs> I'm going to preface the rest of the discussion with, the, uh, with security and, uh, and uh, why it's a, a major concern and why uh, bringing in um, the concept of Internet of Things, distributed sensors uh, with the cloud uh, back end can actually provide opportunities for better security, but certainly could, could uh, bring risks as well. So a couple of points that I wanted to, uh, to make is sort of the, the takeaways. Um, security is really a hard problem. It's, um, it's uh, an emergent issue, it's constantly changing, and is really a consequence of, of how we use technology. Uh, and I think it's important to keep in mind that security must be managed. It's not something that can be bought and forgotten. It's not something that can be solved. Yep, now we took care of security. Tuesday we can do something else. It's always going to be there as technology is constantly changing, as, uh, as our needs, uh, our business, uh, the threat picture changes. Uh, there's going to be changes to security. Let's see if I can bring up my notes here, but that didn't work so well. Um, and as we see this emerging Internet of Things with all these distributed sensors where everyday objects, including um, things in, in building control, uh, w whether it's uh, HVAC, occupancy sensors, all those kinds of things, structural sensors, they become uh, networked, they, they get computing power, things that they haven't had before. And of course, we're see seeing lots of this in lots of, of sectors, whether it's manufacturing, transportation, um, as, as we just talked, to, talked about, uh, earlier today in the panel about the electric grid and so forth. And we're going to see many more network devices than we've ever seen before. This is connectivity on an unprecedented scale. We've never had tens of billions of devices connected to the internet. Uh, at the same time, we're seeing trends that relate to more automation of attacks. The attackers, of course, use the same kinds of tools that make us more productive, and they use that to, to make themselves more organized and their attacks uh, more scalable. We see destructive attacks. You probably all, all saw the, um, the news about the ransomware that, that hit on a, on a global scale uh, just a few weeks ago. Um, destructive attacks have, have been seen, for example, in, in the uh, notorious attacks on the U Ukrainian power grid. 
It's an excellent article in, in Wired, just uh, published a couple of days ago by Andy Greenberg, on uh, how that malware actually um, went went in to destroy uh, the boot records of computers, so that uh, it would would take a lot of effort and a long time to get those computers back online again. Uh, we see cybercrime as a, as a big business. I mean, we call organized crime organized for, for a reason. And there's a lot of money to be, be made both in, in fraud and in extortion uh, using cyber means. And we've also seen this uh, proliferation of cyber weapons where malware produced by various nation states somehow makes it out onto the internet and as opposed to uh, conventional weapons, uh, these can be copied and used by, by others. And we're seeing a lot of well-resourced attackers, whether they're organized crime or uh, military or intelligence services. And in some parts of the world, it's very hard to tell the difference between organized crime and the nation state itself. Um, so uh, one fundamental thing about security is that I see basically security as, as all about separation. You want to separate the good things from the bad things, authorized users from unauthorized users, and so forth. And this notion of separation, of course, runs completely counter to our trend to connect ev everything to everything else. And there are good business reasons to, for all this connectivity where we can, can gather data uh, in ways we have never been able to do before. We can remote control things uh, and so forth. So connectivity is definitely here to stay. We're not going to go back to isolated systems uh, and so forth. But every connectivity also uh, brings a path for an attacker into a system. And we need to actually build systems that provide security in this fully connected environment. And that's some of the things that we, we are working on in, in the computer science laboratory uh, at SRI, where we uh, develop new uh, security measures for the Internet of Things, for example. Uh, we also see this, this notion of um, uh, security being left behind in the rush to get new things to market. And that's one of the major reasons why the state of security is so, uh, so poor as it is in, in some cases, because we, we rush things out there, oh yes, we'll deal with security later, and it turns out that later never really occurs. And you can argue that that's sort of the case with the internet itself. It started as a research experiment. SRI was node number two on the ARPANET, um, and it was originally just a network between sort of institutions that trusted each other, a small group of, of researchers who all knew each other. But as the internet has, has grown, security hasn't really been, been, uh, been added, and it wasn't part of the original design. Um, and what we're seeing now with um, a lot of um, control of physical processes, whether it's, it's uh, building controls or the electric grid or, or uh, self-driving cars or something else, is that the computerized systems have, can have a, a very uh, serious impact on the physical world. It relates very closely to, to safety. Um, it's one thing if, you're, uh, if your email uh, sort of is unavailable for a day, that, that could be bad for your business, but no one's going to die. But if we're looking at, at uh, systems that control volatile processes, uh, controlled uh, cars, etc., all those kinds of things that, that can really have an issue for safety. Um, and uh, in some uh, applications, and particularly, for example, in, in, in building uh, control systems, you have privacy aspects. If you have very fine-grained occupancy sensing, for example, you can figure out exactly how much time Bob spends in his, in his office versus the break room versus somewhere else. Uh, and you can draw all kinds of conclusions around that. And um, one thing that's often brought up when it comes to smart homes, for example, is that it's, it could be easy for, uh, for someone who, who uh, steals information from the system to see uh, whether someone's home or not. Okay. So uh, my, con my, uh, my concluding remark here is that we, we need to be at least as good at building secure systems as we are at building safety critical systems. Uh, we already have systems that, that run Airplanes, for example, and airplanes fortunately don't drop out, out of the sky generally, uh, but we have uh, systems being broken into all the time, and we need to be at least as good as making them secure as making them safe, because we cannot have safety without security. Thank you, Earl. Um, he has given a very good background in terms of security requirement, and which is one of the hesitancy I've seen from end users, consumers, to really use the full benefit of um, cloud control. So the way we have figured it out is we are going to have uh, three more speakers. 
Uh, we have Kevin here, Kevin Fascinelli. He's the executive vice president at uh, Daikin. And how many, uh, Daikin Applied, I believe. And how many of you have heard about Daikin Applied? Well, he will give you a background about that. That's one of the largest uh, HVAC company in the world today. Uh, and then this will be followed by, and he has, been, has a illustrious exper uh, ex experience with Johnson Controls and some other areas. So he knows about the controls, which are the biggest issue when you face this one. And he's very innovative, very creative. I had some conversation with him, and his thinking is always looking into 5, 10, 15 years from now. So he'll share some of the ideas. If he will be followed by presentation by Michael Franco. Michael is the C CEO of a technology company called Riptide IO, and they are developing the controls architecture for some of the HVAC equipment, starting from security as the first one, and they have several big box retails that they are providing today, these services. So he will talk about how they have been able to overcome and how they can address the issues of customers. And this will be followed by Mitchell Kamel. He is the CTO and the founder of a company called Melrock. And they have been also doing cloud-based controls. Um, in fact, they have a recent award from the California Energy Commission to monitor and to control five buildings in uh, Claremont Colleges, I believe. So he'll talk about his company, how they have built their software, their product from the ground up with the security in mind, and how they have been able to reap advantages of these controls. Um, giving it to Kevin next, and I'll load your few slides they have. And after we do about 30 minutes of presentation, we'll go and have a discussion. So please keep your ready, all your questions, and uh, <laughs> okay, all right, that's fine. I just want to move this. Uh... Okay. Let me see. Uh, you know, the turn. <laughs> Okay, wonderful. Well, I'm disappointed that more hands didn't get raised when we asked the question, who is uh, Daikin? Um, but I'm not surprised. Daikin is the world's largest HVAC company, number one market share in Europe, Asia, Australia, and a new entrance into the market in the United States. In 2006, they acquired a company called McQuay. McQuay is the applied side of Daikin products in North America. And then in 2012, they acquired a company called Goodman, Goodman and Amana, the world's largest producer of residential air conditioning in the United States, literally um, by far number one in installation of air conditioning in homes. So it's a, it's a big company. It's making a push in the United States market. And it has a 90-year foundation really focused only on HVAC. We don't make golf carts, we don't make helicopters, we don't do anything else but HVAC. That's it, from top to bottom. So, uh, my deck has a lot of information in it. I'm not gonna go over all that, but I, I feel like when I come out, I owe it to the folks to have the ability to read through that and think about what it says and make your own interpretations. And, a little bit about uh, Japanese style, uh, you, you end up putting a huge amount of information on a slide, so the stuff you're going to see today is not even close to what I have to do on a regular basis. Um, again, largest HVAC company in the world. Uh, we also launched the first IoT-based control system working with Intel starting about five years ago and have that commercially available on our products out in the market. We are focused on energy efficiency. So we came out with the first 20 sear rooftops. And rooftops are the boxes that are on top of the majority of buildings in the United States. They use 80% of the energy for HVAC in the United States is rooftops. From strip malls all the way up to large Walmarts, this is the way in which we air condition buildings. We came up with a product that moved the paradigm from just the minimum sear requirements from 10 to 11, that's seasonal energy efficiency to a product that came out at 20 sear, twice as efficient.
for the same BTUs. Great product, very successful, won an award from the DOE on their energy challenge. We also have products that use magnetic bearing and oilless systems. So these are very high tech, frictionless systems, don't have the maintenance or the problems in terms of oil and other management. Quickly, we have a scope of just about all the products you need. So I'm not gonna go through all what those are, but they're in there, uh, pretty much the whole envelope of what you need for your building or buildings is available from Daikin. I want to talk a little bit about this why are we talking about controlling buildings from the cloud? And why aren't we doing it? So to set up kind of a framework, you gotta think about what are some of the things that are kind of getting in our way. So the first one is cost. So when we think about Moore's Law, and we all know, we probably don't all know, but Moore's Law says every two years you double the amount of transistors and keep or, keep or reduce the cost of that. Now that's been going on for a long, long time. Today, you can get products that are, have a processor, Wi-Fi radio, multiple, call it general purpose I.O. for less than $10. You can get MEMS. These are sensors that can do multifunctions, miniature electromagnetic devices, technology that can do humidity, temperature, uh, lighting, less than $10 the size of your fingernail. The technology right now is ready. The cost structure is ready. The next one is Metcalf's Law. Maybe you do or don't know Metcalf's Law. It just says that the value of a network is the, um, the square of the number of nodes on the network. So you can think if I had two telephones, eh, not too valuable. But if everyone has a cell phone, much more valuable. It's not totally logarithmic. It flattens out a little bit, but in general, that problem's been solved. We have the ability to connect devices. Now, the other problem is this idea of jumping over to a new technology. And that's typically called, you know, getting over the chasm. So we have early adopters that figure out how to use this technology. But at the same time, there are folks that are waiting. And that's, that's really about being pragmatic. What is the value? What are you delivering to me? Not just the technology, but tell me why. Why do I want to do this, and what is it going to benefit me and my company? We'll talk about that. When you put all these together, right now is a very, very ripe time, and has been for a number of years, to implement this technology. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we've come through this journey. Not going to read through all this, but this is what our customers are telling us. This is what they want to solve. And these are the problems they see day in and day out. To break it down very quickly, there's two components to a building, you know, HVAC. One is the actual equipment, okay? That's what's using all your energy. It's, it's a vapor compression cycle. It uses all the energy. So we focus on efficiency. Make the equipment as efficient as possible. So think about a car. Make the miles per gallon as efficient as you can. Now we think about controls. Controls is how you use that. How do you drive that car? How do you operate that asset? That has the ability to create efficiency as well. And it's a difficult problem. It requires domain expertise to be able to understand the protocols and the way in which this equipment can function most optimally within a building. It's not as simple as plugging it in and turning it on and off. So that's one of the reasons why I think a lot of people haven't got into this space as quickly as the domain experience has to be there to be able to operate buildings efficiently. Um, there's just a lot of savings that can be had through the ability to understand the operation of your equipment real time and when there's a problem, as well as be able to constantly commission or tune your equipment for the environment. Now to do that, that's, that's difficult. You do it in your car when you're driving. You're continually monitoring and driving your car, hopefully, as efficient as possible. Maybe not, depending upon where you're going, but you're, you're always doing a calculation. So the cloud's very good at that, is to do a principle-based calculation, constantly calculate what is the best place for me to be and what should I be doing, and then looking forward with foresight at where I'm going to go. Where do I need to get to? not where have I been. Controls today is all about what happened in the past 
it has very little ability to look out what's going to go on in the future. The cloud brings in, through APIs and other information, conditions and situations that I can predict in the future and then prepare for it in the most efficient way. So what, what we did is we started, we kind of flipped over the paradigm, okay? This was, this was fundamental in, in our thinking is before everyone was like controls are the things on the wall, the mechanical equipment's up there and the two, you know, one tells the thing what to do and the other one reacts to what it's being told. From my perspective, it didn't make a whole lot of sense. If I'm using all the energy and the equipment, why not control that equipment and the environment from that same space? What's held that up is really the cost of processing, the cost of networking, the cost of computers. But we were able to overcome that through some gateways and put together really a comprehensive system where we extract, this unit here is a 20 SEER unit, we'll extract 4,000 data points from this. Now, a lot of those are static, some are calculated, but that data goes into the cloud. The vast majority of those are put in the cloud and stationary or non-updated, but, a, but a, about 400 points can be used within analytics to constantly tune the operation and the environment and the condition of the equipment. That's where we start using big data and analytics and algorithms. And then we present that through an HMI, anywhere, anytime to a user, bi-directional, secure <laughs> communications and uh, to the operator, so that if I am operating a building, I don't have to be in the building in front of the, you know, the panel to make my change. I can be physically anywhere understanding that building and understanding that asset, as well as tuning and understanding the health of the asset. Again, these are some business benefits. I put them here not to go through them all, but for to give you guys some sparks some thoughts about why we're doing this and what the advantages are. We break our application really down into, okay, probably better up here, two areas. One, I'm a technical person and I want to get the most out of my product. That's where we use 3D modeling. I can see exactly what the product is I'm, I'm working with, all the features, and I can do pretty much every function that if would require me to be on the roof remotely. We're finding about 40% of problems can be solved through software alone, does not require the role of a truck or that asset to be touched. And then the owner's view is really I am a owner operator of an enterprise, a building, or a building. And I'm concerned with how am I doing in terms of Energy Star, there's a portfolio management product out there that we integrate with APIs, I'm interested in my comfort, demand response, just all the things that help me operate the building better. Now this is all in the cloud and accessible. One last thing to think about is, is the security. So we started really with security first and that's why we got engaged with some of the better people out there, Intel, around what can we do? And we said we want security not to be an issue with our clients. So we took the same security model that's in their highest performance eight-way server and put it in this product. So at the hardware level, we have a secure trusted boot, which means I can't reboot and change my boot image. We have a de device extension, uh, instantiation, if you know what that is. We have whitelisting. We have a cri a crypto, encryption and compression, certificate authority management, buffering and flow control, and then we run algorithms in there to see if there's any time that this <coughs> equipment is outside the normal boundaries of how it should be running, meaning it's being attacked or something's occurring and it'll shut itself down. So we took a very proactive approach knowing that this was something we wanted to take off the table for our clients. So I'll turn it over now to uh, Mike. <coughs> Thank you. So, So there was a very good metric that 40% of the problems can be solved simply by, by this um, software. And if I remember correctly, the energy savings that I've been hearing about through these technologies are like 30 to 50% of the energy can be saved. So you combine these two together, this is a fantastic opportunity. And he touched on some of the opportunities there. So cyber security now, <laughs> network security. All right, I'm gonna to try to stay in my lane here. And, and, and what, I mean, what I mean by that is uh, Riptide is a young 
company with a long history of controlling buildings remotely. Right? And uh, by saying that, I, what I mean by that is, is we, uh, Riptide itself was founded in 2012 by a team, uh, four of us who came out of Cisco Systems. Prior to Cisco Systems, we were with a controls company called Richard Zeta. So we've been doing what used to be called M to M, and now could some people consider that's the, the old label for what uh, IoT is. Um, we've been doing this since the early 2000s. Um, I bring this up because I want to just give examples of what we do for cloud-based controls and how it runs and why, why it's a, a good thing. <laughs> um, but first, so we've, we've, we've done this, uh, we've put cloud-based controls in probably between 4,000, 4, 4,500 buildings. So um, that's, who was saying that, that about the percentage, right? I mean, if there are five, if there are five million commercial buildings in, in the U.S., and we've done 4,000 of them, it'd be interesting to find out how many and see if it really is that one or two percent, but it's, it is a small number. Um, the, the, what, um, our lane is small commercial buildings, and it's important to make that distinction for our use case because in a large, you know, a, a skyscraper, one big, tall, shiny building, you, you can afford to have a, a building engineer sit in the basement and keep that thing running, right? Our model is for buildings that are, say, 50,000 square feet and, and smaller, and are part of a, a geographically dispersed real estate portfolio where it makes no sense to have a building engineer sit in that building. Right? And so, so what we try to do is, is through the technology, turn, give the same capabilities that that facility guy or the building engineer can, can have working in the basement of a skyscraper, have that remotely from a centrally managed method. All right, so, um, and what I thought I'd do here is just, I, I have some slides here that go through, Similar to what Kevin was saying, where uh, I've used them in other, other decks, but the important thing that I really want to get to is, is just to show you a day in the life of how cloud-based building automation works. All right, let's just get to that, and then, uh, so what we do is, is we have this hub, so there's a gateway uh, right now that goes into a building, it connects to the various systems within a building. It could be HVAC, it could be lighting control, meters, sensors, refrigeration. In uh, in our largest deployment, we I mean they went crazy, right? It was it was 18 submetered loads. It was we, we did irrigation. We were monitoring fire and safety. Uh, in addition to what you see here with HVAC, lighting, refrigeration, and more. Um, and people think that. Uh, uh, small buildings, especially small buildings with national account retailers, are all cookie cutter. You know uh, th that that they're easier to manage than than that large skyscraper. But actually, that's not true, right? I mean, th there's actually just as much complexity in the systems that are in these small buildings that are in those big ones, just based on the domains that that you need to touch if you're trying to do some cloud-based control of the whole building. Um, so. This goes in, has supervisory control over HVAC, can you know, turn, uh, can, can set the temperatures to, to whatever the occupants want, uh, turn them off during unoccupied hours, do the same with lighting, measure the metered loads, send those meter, those meter readings up, up to the cloud. Um, we can have some logic that, that goes in place whenever the, the you know, CO2 sensors that are measuring what the CO2 levels can, uh, that are independent from the HVAC can affect the HVAC to open up fresh air, fresh air access, bring in fresh air and make the, make a, a building more comfortable, right? And, and also increase the efficiency too. So um, all, that's the integration part where you put everything together. So. Um, that's the structure of what, go, what goes into our cloud-based building automation, our cloud-based controls. So um, what I have here 
is, I'm just gonna take you through three slides, and the three slides show a day in the life of a remote, centralized uh, uh, building manager or facility manager, right? So, so what we have here, <laughs> map of the US, selection of all this, the, the buildings that they're trying to manage, and then here are uh, key performance indicators. So these are the analytics. You know, these are the analytics that are used that they want to run against a, a, an entire scenario. And, and before I get into this, let me just say, you know, cloud-based building automation isn't looking at a list of all my stores or sites or buildings and then clicking on that and going in and doing the control on that. I mean, that's all possible, but that's really inefficient. If I, uh, one, if I have 2,000 stores, if I have 2,000 stores, how am I gonna manage 2,000 stores by picking, you know, going in like that? And, and so that's possible, but that's, that's not cloud-based building automation. Cloud-based building automation is running metrics and analytics on the aggregation of what you see and, uh, and how the building's being run. So that, when I mentioned that middle column there of, uh, of uh, KPIs, these, these KPIs are uh, customized for how a building portfolio manager wants to run the place. If you are, if you're trying to save the most, squeeze the most dollars out of your energy consumption, right, you're going to be, you're going to keep the temperature a little higher. It's going to be less less comfortable uh, than you may like, and and do things with the lighting and etc. That that, that um, maximize energy is your goal. Uh, this particular customer wants to keep their store at 72 degrees, regardless of what it's like outside, and, and because they're maximizing the comfort of the shoppers that go into this building. So because of that, right, they're looking at things like this one, for example, are there any airflow failures? Are there any air valve failures? Are there any VAV or fit boxes that are in a critical state? Um, those are, are there, what, were they running heat, were they running heat or cool at night? Uh, what's the outside airflow like? So these are things that are important to them to, to make it run, to keep their buildings running well. So they pick one of those, run it against all their stores, and then they get a map, right? They get a map with a bunch of green dots. Uh, I picked lighting emergency override runtime on this particular case. So, so what that meant is that, is that they are, uh, which stores have turned on the lighting override and left it on? And, I mean, it's a real simple one, but it, it happens all the time. And uh, they have a threshold of uh, the amount of hours that, uh, that it needs to go beyond in order to trigger whether it's a, it's a bad site or a good site. Right? So this map comes up, shows me the sites that, where they need to start paying attention to. Um, and then they, they sit, zoom in on this Houston store here, where it came up with, you see here we've got this zone, zone 10, has something that was running 77 and a half hours, same down here in zone one. So, so the guy, the, the centralized manager gets on the phone, talks to the, talks to the local guy and say, what's going on over there? Sometimes there's a good reason for turning that over right on. But, mo but lots of times they're not, and this is just how they run their day. So, so this is, um, there's a lot of noise in what we do with uh, building automation. And by that I mean, there's a lot of promise to do uh, things that are five years out, 10 years out. And, and what we're really finding is there's a lot of low hanging fruit with the most simple things that you can do right away. Things like just people leaving overrides on, uh, running, uh, uh, running, not seeing the faults in in equipment because it's up in the roof on the roof and you can't see the problems as well. And so what we try to do with this in a cent make it easy for a centralized manager to find out what those faults are. And um, last slide I have is just just one right here. This one right here. The, the point is, these are all common faults that happen in commercial buildings. 
right? That if you look at the impact of the top, say, three to five of those, those are, those are easy to detect centrally. And let's not get caught up into looking at all these things on the bottom of the list. Let's focus on the easy things to detect, deal with the, the low-hanging fruit first, and that's the way to get, you know, that's the way to get efficiency from cloud-based building automation. So um, as we go through here, my lane is going to be having actually done this in more than 4,000 buildings. So, and, and, and what works and what is, what is not, <laughs> what's, what's wasted effort. So uh, when it comes to the discussion part, that's where I'm gonna be focusing. Thank you. So if you have done about 4,000 of these box stores, now Michelle is gonna talk about, I think how he has done several hundred, uh, several hundred maybe thousand stores or so. So he's gonna talk about his, uh, solution that he has been able to hone in and how he's going to do this project under the California Energy Commission uh, grant. Okay, is this? Okay, add it anyway. Okay, add it anyway. Still, I'm not getting it here. Pardon? Sort of presentation. Um, also reading. Leave it to Microsoft. Change menus every day. <laughs> Do we have an expert over here who can? Uh, okay, hello, master slide. You go to slide. slide show. Yeah, where is the slide? Show? At the top. Oh, okay, it's not sure. Oh. That you are not used. Uh, actually, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, um, so my name is Michel. I'm with Malrock. We are a relatively young company. Um, started my garage about 2008, like uh, a lot of other Silicon Valley companies, except my garage was not in Silicon Valley, and um, I stayed there about two, three years. But then in 2011, we really took off. And uh, what we focus on is data, and control uh, messaging, basically communication between energy devices in buildings and the cloud. And I make a clear distinction between data messaging and control messaging, and, and you'll see why as I go through the slides. But a lot of it has to do actually with security and cybersecurity issues um, because the requirements are different. Um, and what the applications of this are multifold. Uh, Sometimes customers just want to be able to monitor what's going on, and sometimes they want to do ROI calculations. But there's more and more talk about demand response and about distributed energy resource management. And of course, what we're uh, here to talk about today, which is cloud-managed devices. Um, unfortunately, we are in an industry that is a bit uh, kind of challenged or, or handicapped by the fact that it's not, forgive the expression, it's not too sexy. Um, if this was the car industry, for example, this would be all over the front page news, it would be self-driving cars, and you'll have a top model, not me presenting it, but you stuck with me. So, um, you know, we, we talk, we're, we're getting to the age of, of self-driving buildings, and, uh, you know, in a car commercial, they, they get the nice-looking guys and gals, and they're driving the car, but they're not drivers, they're pilots, right? So they're piloting the car and zigzagging. So next time you're stuck on the freeway, whether it's the 101 or the 280 or the 88 or the 580, remember, you're piloting your car at five miles an hour. <laughs> so buildings, we call them energy managers. And I did some calculation after I sat with Mukesh last night, and you told me three miles per kilowatt hour. Where's Mukesh? He stepped up. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So you said three miles per kilowatt hour, right, for an electric vehicle, whatever it is. Uh, so let's say two to three uh, or two to four, I, 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 I called some friends who have that and I set it on a number of two to three miles per kilowatt hour. And if you drive 12,000 miles a year, that's about four megawatt hour per car, right? Electric vehicle car that you use every year, right? Well, your 30,000 square foot building uses five to 600 megawatt hour per car, 
uh, per, per year, right? That's about 100, up to 150 cars. We don't have 150 occupants in a 30,000 square foot building, right? So my point is, the building energy manager versus the, the car pilot is actually managing a lot more energy than the car pilot is, right? Um, so we should pay attention to it, and we should enable that energy uh, or the building pilot uh, with, with as much resources and capabilities and computer power that we can, and hence, we gotta go to the cloud, right? Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, our, our first deployment of a totally self-driven building or cloud-managed building at Pomona College. This is the project that was funded by the California Energy Commission. And um, we're gonna take five buildings on campus and literally disable the local energy management system and put a gateway in there and totally manage every device from the cloud automatically with no energy manager there. Um, and it's gonna be exciting and we, uh, we, we are, you know, um, on the record to saving 20% energy, I think we're gonna save a lot more. But if you think about it, if we can save 20 or 30% energy by going to the cloud, we may not need the Paris Climate Accord. Um, so, and, and all the headaches that come with it. So, um, in, in summary, I'm gonna talk about this, and I'm gonna talk about the platform, focus really on the platform, because not all cloud solutions are born equal. A lot of people will take something, and now you can see it via a website, and oh yeah, we have a cloud solution. You know, the cloud is a different beast, and, and going to the cloud, why there's a lot of reluctance, is because there are no real standards on going to the cloud. What does it involve? What are the security standards? What about the open interfaces and, and, and whatnot? And there's also another reason that I wanna talk about why we need to go to the cloud, and it's not only for the 20 to 30% savings that come with it, but buildings in the form we know them today, the static building sitting there and it's passively managed, that's, that, that building belongs to the old grid. The new grid, if we wanna support 20, 30, 50%, and I think there's a bill now in California for 100% renewable grid, we cannot have buildings that react the next day or a month later. We have to have buildings that react every second basically to the grid and every second interact with the buildings around it and with the grid. And you can't do this from a, a, an isolated and islanded uh, energy management system. So for, uh, to, when you talk about a cloud platform, you really need to start laying the standards for, you know, I like to call it the CSI model, the cloud system interconnection, you know, it's kind of a spin-off of the OSI model that makes the internet possible. But you do need to think about multiple layers. First, you have the interconnectivity layer where you actually talk to the different um, energy assets. And that's the Tower of Babel. If you've ever been in a building and if you ever looked at the energy devices in there, you've got half, at the very least half a dozen protocols that are being supported and potentially even half a dozen different physical interfaces, whether they're wired, wireless, or pulse counters, arm waving, and so on. So you have all these different uh, and interconnectivity challenges to deal with these assets that exist. And then we like to separate upload processes because if somebody hacks into your data upload process, okay, there's some maybe uh, proprietary issues to deal with and other things, but the, the damage is, is, is limited. Um, but if someone hacks into your control, your message delivery process, now that's a big thing, right? They can shut down your building. They can take down the LA grid just by hacking into the inverters, solar inverters. So we gotta separate this. Plus the bandwidth requirements are different. You need a lot more bandwidth in the upload because you're monitoring 4,000 points, right? But in the download, you may be sending one or two control messages. So we separate these and we have different requirements and standards for upload and download. And of course, you have to serve it. And all this has to be done on a secure platform, right? So security has to be the foundation on which you build these things. And another thing that's big is the open services. We cannot build a cloud platform today with the legacy, the traditional culture of I'm, I'm gonna name names, so please forgive me. I'm Honeywell and I do this, and I'm Schneider and I do this, and I'm JCI and I do this, right? We can't, we gotta open the data, make it available, because that's how uh, you know, advancements happen in today's age. So it's very, th three simple steps, you know, connectivity, secure big data pipelines, and then cloud uh, analytics. Um, I love to show this, because interconnectivity is, is really a bigger challenge than people think. Um, I like this, uh, this cartoon by uh, Randall Monroe. Uh, you know, they get together, hey, there are 14 standards around this issue, let's, let's create another one that's universal, and now, of course, we have 15 standards around this issue, and 
um, I, you know, uh, it, it, this is not only typical to the energy industry, but really uh, every other industry. So uh, the uh, last thing I want to mention is security cannot be, like uh, Ulf said, an afterthought. Uh, it's got to be by design and, and uh, is 100% right, it's got to be continuously managed. So we're always thinking about adding defense layers, like any, anything else, you always need to add defense layers to your, uh, to, to your platform. And one of the things we've invested in is uh, putting actually FM radios. So uh, on your way here, you may have listened to Coit FM or some other radio station. We actually go and piggyback on those exact same commercial stations where there's like one or two massive antennas in every city uh, for every station. And we piggyback on it, we hitch a ride, and we send our own control signals to our own devices. Now try hacking that from China or India or anywhere else, right? It's, it's practically impossible. And now when you couple that with the other communication channel, whether it be 4G or anything else, then you have a very, very robust system with kind of dual or multiple path of security and, and layers of security. And our routers, by the way, um, I don't have a picture of my, our, our router here, it's that little diamond thing on the bottom right, but our routers do get hacked. They do get hacked almost, I mean, attempted hacked. Like whenever we put one at a customer's site, we literally get a few times a second continuously, right? That we actually have our own firewalls inside our router, even though we're, beyond, uh, we, we're behind the customer's firewalls. So security has to be embedded in the design from day one, because we're not gonna have cloud management and we're not gonna have big data engines without the data. And so you need the secure and robust data pipeline to the cloud. Thank you. I'd like to open up for discussion. Uh, any comments you have, any questions you have, we'll have for the audience. Uh, you can pick up any one person or us in general. We'll be happy to answer it. Yes, sir? Jerry? Let me, let me come with the security stuff. I mean, all this is great stuff. Um, do, you, do you folks who are deploying things, do you have penetration teams uh, that test them out and go do um, uh, on-site studies to look for human error? The reason I ask this is I'm a really ancient Bell Labs Unix guy, mm -hmm. and I used to do security audits, okay? And we'd, we'd hear about a lab that said they have a great new password scheme, and we'd do the audit. We'd say, yeah, your password scheme is good. But there's two problems. You've got yellow stickies everywhere with the root password, and the lab gets hot, so you leave the door open. So uh, I've always thought human laziness uh, was, you know, probably the worst security problem. So, so t talk some about the practical stuff that you do to try to, to look for problems like that. I'll, I'll take the scar of this. Um, very good question. And um, actually, we're we, we lucky enough. Uh, because we're at the stage where you're not working with mom and pop shops, right? You're working with large retailers. We have from Fortune 1 companies as our customers to you know, Fortune 100 companies. And uh, we do our own testing. We have some third parties, but they do the testing too, right? So be before we put any gateway in any one of these customer sites, it has to go through the IT department and we have our own exchanges with them. And, and uh, does two things. It improves the robustness of our system, but also helps us to quickly evaluate who's the smart, you know, who are the good people who are not. And you'd be surprised, there'll be some really large companies, but their IT department is not the best. And then you'll have another company and they're doing everything beyond and beyond, right, to do this. So to answer your question is, yes, we do some of it ourselves, but we also rely a lot on the partnership with our uh, customers where we send them the unit ahead of time, anytime there's a new firmware upgrade or anything like this, and then they, they, they really put it through all the, and they usually have more money to pay for the more expensive tools, so. Yeah, I can make a few comments on that. Um, one of the things we do is third-party testing on all of our security models and stress it and look for any issues. Um, when we selected our topology, we uh, have in our gateway 3G, 4G, plus Wi-Fi, plus Ethernet. So literally we can run off corporate network directly into the, the cloud and stay isolated from the IT department entirely, which is very attractive if you've ever walked into an IT department and asked them to push building data around their network. Uh, they're very risk adverse and they would tell you the first thing is no, and then the second answer is no, and you, that's really the problem with a lot of these implementations is the IT department does not want to take the risk, the reward is not explained great enough for them to take that risk. 
So we take that kind of out of the equation. We're also working with another company that just uh, received the first uh, gateway device to UL 2900 uh, 2-2, uh, which is the UL cybersecurity standard, first IoT gateway to get that uh, approval through the UL for their security model. So yeah, we're, we're very cautious as we're a $20 billion company. We do not want to be the problem for our large enterprise customers in terms of their POS systems or any of their data. So we try to isolate as much as possible from, from those networks. So let me reinforce what you said about the IT department's hesitancy to let the building data flow on their network. You know, one of my previous uh, job, I started a project in 2007, and by the time I left in 2014, we have had gone through hundreds of meetings, and it was not yet approved by the IT department. <laughs> And this was one company that was saying, everybody else, you should be moving your applications to my cloud. So you can think about what goes on there. Question, please. So um, what's the penetration rate? Uh, this is actually for uh, Kevin. What's the penetration rate in the United States for IoT for buildings, for what you do, versus Europe, Asia, and other places? I'm just curious. Yeah, um, Daikin Applied was is really kind of the spearhead within the Daikin Industries for an IoT cloud-based control system. So we are starting to see uh, more and more of the orders coming in with this feature enabled. Um, our next generation really is about putting this feature into equipment at a zero cost position. So there is no upsell. It's kind of think about uh, if you go to the store and you're looking at your smart TV and one has Netflix you know, or Amazon or the gateway built in and one doesn't, you know, you're not going to pay more for that. You're, the expectation is it's there. You may desire, you may use it or not. And that's our, our philosophy is to have it on 100% of everything, at least the capability to be activated if the customer desires. So I guess the follow-up question is, what you're saying is, is that you're abandoning what, the way you used to do it. Is that true or not true? You're going to IoT for... Yeah, uh, we're primarily a uh, hardware yeah. company. Yeah. We do have some controls capability, but when we look at our controls, uh, building controls portion of the business, it is microscopic compared to Honeywell or to Johnson Controls, who I used to work for. So it's really kind of, instead of investing in um, DDC layered control for a building, we, we said let's invest in future topology based upon a cloud in a much uh, narrow IP stack from sensor to cloud. So we take out multiple field controllers layers and uh, that allows for a much more affordable system. And if it's architected appropriately, you don't necessarily lose any of the redundancy or control capability. If anything, you gain some of that based upon where you place that, if it's on the edge or in the middle device layer. So I, I think field controllers are Passe, once we go to IP, there's just no reason for that. You still could have supervisory, and that's really could be placed in the gateway itself. So that supervisory can control can be done locally, as well as uh, advanced functions done in the cloud. So you're not necessarily, if you lose the cloud, you don't lose control of your building. Go ahead, please. Um, two months ago in April, the uh, American Physical Society, we held a high-level workshop two days in Monterey. The title was The Actualization of the Internet of Things. And it really got down into the grisly details. Uh, I can give you the, all the talks that are online if you're interested in following up. Now, we had DOD. We had several of the NAT labs, California universities, GE, IBM, Boeing, uh, and a number of other organizations I can't remember right now. But what I wanted to bring up, there's a lot of concern about security and communications, particularly between sensors and data collection devices. And two topics were brought up to which there is not yet quite uh, a solution. Two-factor authorization and uh, quantum encryption. Now, is this community looking into any of that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we're, uh, we're actually working on, on both of those issues, how, how to do 
secure authentication, especially between devices, because as, as one of the speakers mentioned, what was used to be called machine to machine is now called IoT, but it's, it's really a lot about devices communicating with each other with uh, little interaction from, from, from people. Uh, and the other issue about, about quantum uh, safe uh, uh, crypto, for example. So this is the, this notion that, that uh, the encryption mechanisms that today really form the basis for, for the uh, protection of our data in all e-commerce and so forth are, uh, could easily be broken, supposedly, through a quantum computer when one such computer actually uh, materializes. Uh, because they're, they're built on, on, uh, on the fact that some, some problems like, like uh, factoring of very large uh, integers is, is a difficult problem, but, but it's much easier with, with a con quantum computer. So the research community is working on post-quantum uh, encryption technologies, and, and uh, our team at SRI, for example, is very, very involved in developing that. So there are other uh, theoretical constructs uh, other than uh, factoring of large numbers that, that, that can be used, but that, that's is being developed actively right now. Uh, uh, the NIST, the government's standards agency, uh, is, is, uh, is running a, a competition for, for post-quantum uh, crypto functions that we're participating in and so forth. So yes, we're looking at that. Uh, but there are other, other threats to our crypto mechanisms than just quantum computers. It could be that any time now a big mathematical breakthrough could happen that makes it, that has the same effect. Uh, so. Uh, that's something that, that always needs to be considered, that we can't hard code in mechanisms. We have to be ready to swap in and out uh, new security mechanisms as needed. I think for the, depending upon what the information is that you're transmitting and the importance, there's different techniques, obviously. I mean, if you look at uh, blockchain as one uh, technique that is extremely uh, difficult, because of the way in which it's architected, it's distributed, and it's decentralized, um, that type of technology may be appropriate for certain functions within this architecture, going from a MEMS to, a, uh, to a, uh, an HVAC device directly. I'm probably not going to use blockchain uh, on that. But there, there's definitely a lot going on in this space. Like I said, the, uh, the new UL standards and I think it's a very appropriate question for anyone getting in this is what are you doing to secure your, your customer's data? The sort of bigger uh, aspect of, of the question is here, given the, uh, the type of, of systems that are put in place in, in buildings and so forth, uh, as we all know, they tend to have very long lifetimes. They tend yeah. to be, be in place uh, for, for decades, perhaps. So we, we need to make sure that we, we're forward-looking when it comes to uh, not just the functionality, but also security. Again, that it's possible to, to upgrade security mm -hmm. of systems, et cetera. And of course, uh, moving a lot of the, the, uh, the security functions to cloud-based solutions makes those kind of updates easier. Um, one fundamental question we haven't asked as we talk, this is all about the cloud. So what is the cloud, really? Um, one can see it as your data resides on someone else's computer. That's sort of the fundamentals of it. Uh, a computer that seems to have unlimited capacity for storage and computation. And there's all those kinds of issues that comes with actually having your data on someone else's computer. And, and you mentioned, for example, making sure that uh, the buildings can still be controlled even when connectivity goes down. So things of that nature needs to be considered as well. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you. Excellent discussion. Um, Ami Amarnath from APRI, one of Mukesh's colleagues. Uh, uh, very good discussions, but um, Michael, you kind of touched upon it, but can, can the whole group talk about kind of the big picture um, in, in the sense that uh, if, if Mukesh initially said, you know, it's a very, very small percentage of buildings are controlled by the cloud. So if that expands, what it would do to efficiency on a large scale for the whole country? And even expanding beyond that, what it would do to climate change or, or you know, carbon dioxide emissions, you know, from, from the power plants, how much uh, reduction there would be in kilowatt hours. So, can you talk a little bit about the the, the big picture on, on on where you think this is going? You know, this is to every one of you. Uh, and the second item is, uh, I didn't hear anybody talk about uh, you know customer comfort, you know, productivity improvement, 
with with doing you know these things with uh, new building new technology of controlling buildings can any of you address that part so two questions one is big picture on on carbon emissions the second one is on customer yeah, let me, i'll go ahead and start with your second one um, okay. when i when i was showing those screens they were all for customer comfort right the, and, and it's a great point because I mean, what Michelle said about us not being in a sexy industry <laughs> is really true. Uh, and the closest we get to sexy is to talk about energy savings. But that's not fundamentally what drives uh, the, the, our customers. What fun fundamentally drives the reason they buy our system is comfort and maintenance and repair. Uh, so uh, over the life of equipment, the amount they would save on energy, it's uh, over the life of the equipment, they spend eight times as that amount on repairs and maintenance. So if we can have an impact on repair and maintenance, that's the, that's, you know, that has a much more important uh, factor there. And then the second thing is, is comfort. Yeah, absolutely. It's, I mean, we can save all kinds of energy by turning off the, off the heat. Are off the cool, <laughs> right? Uh, but but uh, you know you're gonna it, we're in in retail, and that's gonna chase all the customers away. <laughs> so so I mean it's, it sounds silly, but they, but take it to another level of comfort. It's not just temperature, right? It's humidity, it's CO2, and other factors like that. And so uh, these kind of systems can bring that in, you know, run the analytics on uh, uh, which places which places have high CO2 levels, where there are humidity issues, and and other things like that. Yeah, I, I can maybe break break it down to some really tangible examples for you all. So our customer base, um, education today, people are looking at how well kids are learning. And schools are rated on how well kids are learning. And the environment which they're learning in has a direct impact on their ability to absorb information and process it. So when we're doing our best job, we're invisible. You don't hear us, you don't feel us. We're not distracting your senses away from what you're focusing on. So that would be in the education market. In the healthcare market, uh, if you go to the doctor nowadays, I guarantee you within a week, you're gonna get a survey of 40 questions, and you're going, where, why, where'd this come from? Because the healthcare industry also gets paid on your satisfaction. And a good portion of your satisfaction is your doctor and care, but also when you're hospitalized or in that building, there's tangible things that you recognize as being a good environment or a bad environment. Hospital administration, you talk to someone that runs a hospital, their number one concern, number one, infectious disease control. So the environment. The environment has a big impact on infectious disease propagation. So Mike said humidity, temperature, these are, I mean, this is bottom line, dollar and cents for so many industries. You just have to step back from it and see how you, how, how our industry contributes or does not contribute. Um, big picture wise, I, I'm an efficiency believer. I don't think the cloud and cloud stuff, there, there's a, so many tangibles, but really it's about more efficient equipment. So people aren't talking about training you to drive your car more efficiently. They're, you're pretty much saying, hey, get a more efficient car. That's, that's gonna be the bigger impact because you may be able to squeeze a couple miles per hour out on how you drive it, but you're never gonna get a, 20 mile an hour gallon car to do 50 mile, or miles per gallon. Is it possible? So, thank you. Let me add two things. Uh, I'm gonna, um, so, so first, I want to reinforce what Michael said, and I think actually the pendulum will swing the other way. Uh, in terms of cost and comfort, will probably increase. Um, I, you know, you see Irvine, one of our customers. I sat down for a few days with their energy managers, about half a dozen people, in, in a couple of containers. And I'm looking at, they have like five screens in front of them with every possible data point you can quote unquote trend. And I say, that's impressive. I go, how do you know something went wrong? And he looks at the phone, he goes, the phone rings. Right? So at the end of the day, the phone rings. And I think with the predictive analytics in the cloud and other things, uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, what's going to happen is the phone is going to ring less. Right? Um, now, I, I do agree that the, Equipment has to be efficient. Uh, however, uh, you can have the most efficient chiller if you turn it on all day long and all night long. You're not helping. And there's an anecdotal thing, which is actually not anecdotal, 
a lot of customers, when they benefit from the lighting retrofits incentives with Southern California Edison, uh, SCE has stats on how many customers actually their lighting went up, even though they put more efficient lighting, and that's because they replaced the light bulbs and half them were burnt and they didn't really need them, right? So the point is, yes, you need the efficient equipment, but you also need to uh, use it properly and use it efficiently. The worst thing you can do is pay a lot of money for efficient equipment and you have your economizer stuck open on a hot day, right? And it happens all the time, right? Last question. Thank you, but the most important question. So in the construction industry today, one of the most exciting trends that I've seen, revolutionary trends, is prefabrication uh, panelization, effectively. And panelization allows us to embed sensors in walls, build mesh networks, you can put them in the roof, and you can design the ultimate energy efficiency system because you're not doing a custom job every time you go to a build site. So I'd like to ask you guys, how does that re uh, affect your respective businesses? For, for mine, I, I totally understand where you're coming from, and, and we have an approach for our our systems are factory mounted installed control systems that are terminated like our VAV boxes. It's just you plug the wire in, and it's we discover it, and it's based on the cloud. And we're not we're not doing artwork on every building, and that's what you're really getting at. Is is there a best model? for running this type of building for this type of application. And if there is, why are we allowing every individual contractor and architect to go a different route on how they're gonna control that? That's just how the industry has grown up. But uh, all of our stuff is, uh, let's just say, ready to start up. So to do a building control job, typically, it, the expense is binding of the points and then setting up your sequences that you've chosen as the contractor or installer that you think are the best. Uh, that takes, on an average building, weeks. Our stuff, you plug it in, you run the application, and there is, it's all binded already. It's all together, and now you're tuning for different case scenarios, like Mike said. You know, I'm tuning for comfort or I'm tuning for energy savings and you know, working on that. We've also built in a comfort index. So we, we look at not just 72 degrees, we look at humidity, we look at the time of year, we look at the amount of activity in the space, um, humidity as well, and we run analytics on that that's based on an ARI standard that will spit out where, where you are in terms of your comfort index based upon six different variables so that we are you know, not using too much energy or potentially, you know, ignoring the environment and not using enough. I'll say one thing about panelization. I mean, I, I think that um, the, the installations we do are, are a mix of new construction and retrofit, right? And, and when you can, so uh, new construction gives you all the flexibility and everybody in our industry loves new construction because you come in right away, right? But, but the majority of the business is, is retrofit. And, and in my lane of, of retail, right, the uh, stores do refreshes all the time uh, and panelization of the partitioning walls and, and it makes it easy to, to create new spaces and sit new sales floor over here or something like that. But, uh, you know, I don't know if you, do you know like the dirt system? Do you know that one? Yeah. So, so dirt is a great system for, for panelizing interior spaces. Makes it tough on retrofit for HVAC if you've got a duct system and, and, and it becomes real expensive because now you've got to you know, redo everything there. So I know there's a lot of ductless systems that, that make it easier. Um, but uh, so the zoning aspect, uh, you know, I mean, my, my – to get that maximized comfort if you're going to repartition it and be really flexible there. I mean, there is a factor of I wish I could, I wish I could you know, snap my fingers and, and do that rezoning together with the partition space. So, that's a tough one. So. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I think we are going to continue this conversation. There is a session after this one that's called Conversation for Action. That will be in the main hall. There are a couple of tables where most of the people will be available. We can continue the conversation. And you will hear something very surprising I heard last night. And that is trying to maintain a building besides 72 degrees 
uses less energy, less maintenance cost than a system like you will see in Dollar General that is not maintaining the temperature very correctly, uses more energy and more maintenance cost. These are some of the observations that I found out in my conversation with this team here. They will be available there, so we can continue the conversation after a short break. First, I want to thank the whole team there. They came from very far off distances here. They did a very good job, so thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great.